All right, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Potch. And Dr. Adai is about to join us. I just let him in. Okay. I'll wait for him to jump. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to talk, um, Ashley and the IVU Med. I'll give Dr. Adai a, a second to join us. Uh, <clears throat> I also have some kind of upper respiratory thing. So if I cough, you know, start coughing violently, I have some, some tea and some water, but uh, just bear with uh, some upper, upper respiratory winter stuff uh, that I may be suffering through. Um, okay. So we'll start uh, talking about muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and let me see if I can get the next slide to go. Okay. So uh, there's actually, I tried to look this up uh, in preparation for this talk. Uh, to discuss sort of uh, bladder cancer and incidence rates in Africa. And there's not actually that much published. There's an article published in 2019 from some registry data uh, looking at incidence and in bladder cancer in Africa. Uh, most of it's uh, related to, at least in North Africa, related to uh, schistosomiasis and what we see is, uh, as you know, the textbook says, uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Um, but urothelial cell carcinoma is actually on the rise, um, sort of at least in the North Africa population uh, because of an increase in smoking. Uh, I was actually in Egypt in 2019 giving some lectures uh, on behalf of the AUA and what some of the uh, urologists as part of the Egyptian Urology Society told me was that they think now their, their numbers of urothelial cell carcinomas are about equal to those of squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, uh, nationally, which is sort of an interesting trend. And I think uh, that has a lot to do with sort of the prevalence of smoking and maybe sort of understanding the, the risk of schistosomiasis, at least in North Africa. Um, so the incidence rates, you can see, at least by this slide, <clears throat> is about 10 out of 100,000 people in North Africa. And then in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 5 out of 100,000 people. So much sort of less if you sort of move out of that North Africa schistosomiasis area. Uh, the... <clears throat> Um, and this is just one of the tables, super busy table, uh, but sort of broken down by region. Uh, and you can see here on the on the bottom, but even by country, like Ivory Coast compared to Egypt, which has you know sort of the highest, and Libya again, North African countries uh, compared to some of the West African countries and <clears throat> Sub-Saharan Africa uh, African countries. So those those rates are much lower. Again, likely related to this uh, concept of the squamous cell carcinoma compared to urothelial cell. And, you know, by their study, there was this breakdown between male and females. And we know that at least historically, males have a higher rate of bladder cancer, uh, you know, four to, four, four to five times as high compared to females. Uh, and so as representative, and that's what you can see in this graph also. Um, so when we talk about bladder cancer, it's important to stage. And I, if we're talking about muscle invasive disease, then we're sort of jumping to stage two and beyond. Um, so I think it's important to just to review some of the staging of bladder cancer before we talk about how we're, we treat it. Um, so for stage two, that's typically a muscle invasive disease uh, and, and zero. Um, if you jump to stage 3A and the, <clears throat> the higher stages are broken down into A, B, and uh, A's and B's. So stage three, you can see is a T3 tumor, which is either into the, the microscopic fat or the macroscopic fat or any T stage plus a single node uh, that's positive in the true pelvis. So that bumps you. If you have a suspicious node, uh, if you're doing clinical staging, that'll make you a 3A. Um, and then the 3Bs are having either multiple nodes in the true pelvis or higher up in the, the, uh, the lymph node chain to having a, um, <clears throat> a, a node in the comic iliac or higher, and then any sort of T stage associated with that. So even if you've got a T1 tumor, if you've got nodal disease, it sort of bumps you up into the 3B stage. And stage 4As, <clears throat> Uh, are typically uh, locally advanced tumors with any nodes that are positive. And these are locally advanced, not into uh, individual structures, which is your T4A, but sort of into the pelvic sidewall where you're considering something to really be unresectable. Or if you've got a metastatic lymph node, again, that's higher in the lymphatic chain beyond the common iliacs, <clears throat> peri-aortic or paracable lymph nodes. And the stage four Bs are any Ts, any As, and uh, M1 Bs, which is basically a lymph node metastatic, or sorry, non-lymph node metastatic disease. So metastatic disease to the lungs, liver, uh, bone, uh, et cetera, uh, that puts you at the sort of the highest stage, which, which is at that 4B <coughs> zone. Um, so according to the NCCN guidelines, so these are the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, uh, 
for stage two, again, just your muscle invasive bladder cancer, you have to obviously do um, staging studies, make sure that they have not developed worse cancer or metastatic disease. And then really treatment options are either to give them chemotherapy, IV, uh, which <clears throat> has been shown to improve survival, and then do an operation to surgically remove the bladder. Uh, if chemotherapy is not available or patients are ineligible for chemotherapy because of their kidney function or hearing loss or uh, peripheral neuropathies, then you can move straight to cystectomy. Uh, I think that there's also <clears throat> a group out of MD Anderson that sort of divides muscle invasive disease between high risk and low risk, depending upon pathologic features. And for those low risk muscle invasive bladder cancers, a lot of the folks at MD Anderson actually move straight to cystectomy rather than giving neoadjuvant chemo, uh, but that's sort of up for debate. Um, if you've got some isolated tumors sitting at the dome of the bladder, uh, you could consider doing a partial cystectomy. So just basically excising the top of the bladder. Some of the problems with partial cystectomy uh, are that <clears throat> you would need to make sure that they don't have microscopic disease or CIS carcinoma site doing the rest of the bladder. So you don't want to leave obviously diseased bladder intact if you're doing a partial cystectomy. And the other consideration is uh, that if the tumors are big enough, you don't want to cause uh, really a drop in overall bladder capacity. If you drop the bladder capacity, then patients are miserable. If you give them a hundred cc capacity bladder, they're peeing every 90 minutes that really affects quality of life. Uh, <clears throat> you can also do bladder preservation. Um, there are some centers in the US that do more or less bladder preservation depending upon sort of the makeup of the, uh, of the department and the philosophy in terms of how to manage bladder cancer. Uh, but bladder preservation typically includes maximal TUR, basically resecting all of the visible tumor endoscopically followed by a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. And the same chemotherapy, at least cisplatin, that we use for neoadjuvant chemo, so chemo before surgery, we use for the bladder preservation treatment. There are certain guidelines about who should get bladder preservation or certain, certain parameters. Uh, usually it's isolated tumors. Again, tumors that are not near the UO or patients without hydronephrosis. Some of those guidelines are uh, have been a little bit expanded to try to cover a little bit more patients that either decline cystectomy, bladder removal, or uh, <clears throat> uh, have seen better results with uh, radiation over the years as we sort of get better at tar targeting. Um, so, <clears throat> to next slide. So, if you're talking about cystectomy specifically or radical cystectomy, um, I think it's always important to sort of uh, um, be appropriately prepared for the operation. And we'll talk specifically about the operation itself. Uh, but I think it's important to look at films and look at the body. Uh, we do a lot of virtual visits now because of COVID. And so sometimes you'll you'll talk to a patient and they won't tell you that they have any operations or any trauma to the abdomen. And then when they show up for a visit or for a clinic or for a procedure, all of a sudden you lift up their shirt and they've got multiple you know, incisions or scars and, you know, then the things that they neglect to tell you on the initial evaluation. So it's always that physical exam is always key. And it's also important to look if you're considering doing stomas on patients. Um, and again, the rates of stoma sort of vary between region, uh, but it's important to be able to uh, isolate and locate that stoma. I always like to look at this idea of skin to fascia distance, which is basically on your CT scan or even on physical examination where that, the fascia is in relationship to the skin and how far you have to traverse if you're going to do a stoma. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, we tried to do a study years ago looking at the sort of skin to fascia distance and stoma complications. It's sort of hard to quantify some of that stuff, but I think it's important. If you're considering doing a continent diversion, I always like to look at um, the takeoff of the SMA to get a sense of where or how far down my small bowel will be able to travel. There's no hard and fast rule about that. But it's nice to get a sense is if, if the patient has a really long torso, it may, may cause trouble in terms of getting access or bringing a neobladder down to the pelvis. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I've got a couple of slides to talk about some maneuvers in order to do that. Um, and you can also see on a CT scan if there's small bowel already in the pelvis, if you've got um, sort of tumor that's already, or small bowel that's already sitting sort of draped on top of the bladder, you know it's easier to get a neobladder down into the pelvis rather than sort of uh, small bowel that may be tucked up a little bit higher. And then it's always important to know whether somebody's uh, uh, resectable and really can you do, can you give them the right operation or are you going to be leaving, you know, tumor behind? Um, and then when I talk to patients about urinary diversions, um, I always, we try to do as many continent diversions as we can in our institution, neobladders or continent calf diversions. Uh, but you always need to have an option for a bailout if, the, if things don't reach or if you've got cancer at your apical margin, 
uh, during serious cystectomy, you don't necessarily want to do a continent diversion to that, or if the bowel doesn't look healthy and you don't think you have enough viable bowel. <laughs> so you always need to do or consider doing uh, counseling for diversions for a bailout of a urostomy. Uh, so for cystectomy, typically the steps are, hold on, I've got this in my way. Uh, it can usually be done either open or robotic. In the U.S., there's a growing trend to do things using a surgical robot, the Da Vinci uh, we don't do a lot of those at our institution. I would say probably about five to 10% are done robotically. I think um, even though there's studies to support the use of robotic cystectomy and equivalency outcomes, um, you know, at our institution, uh, we've shown that we can get patients out about the same in terms of length of stay. So I think that um, our surgical outcomes are probably pretty equivalent, but I think that there's value in both approaches. Um, so typically, uh, the first thing you do is you, you sort of make an incision and then look around the belly, because uh, there are some uh, bladder tumors that <clears throat> have a propensity to travel along the surfaces of the peritoneum. Uh, typically, your plasmacytoid differentiated tumors will do that. You get this speckled appearance in the bladder, or sorry, in the abdomen, and you'll see sort of these white pearly areas. And so if you send those out for frozen section, those may come back positive. And a lot of times that stuff won't come back. Uh, or you're not, you're not able to see that on your preoperative CT scans or imaging. And so um, it's always important to make sure the patients don't have this sort of occult metastatic disease picture. After you do that, you basically incise uh, the posterior peritoneum, find the ureters, track the ureters down to the pelvis, <clears throat> divide them. Some people will send frozen sections or send samples of the ureters to be evaluated for a tumor. Um, I think that there's uh, a debate in terms of utility because you can see skip lesions along the ureters. Uh, where you won't see tumor, then you'll see tumor, then you won't see tumor. So it's sort of hard to know if you're in the right spot. And then there's sort of a false positive and false negative associated with those things as well. Uh, for men, and I divided this sort of between men and women, men on the left side here, you can uh, get into the spates of resius, then you do lateral dissection of the vas deferens. Uh, and then we typically will incise the, the posterior peritoneum and get uh, above the rectal wall and uh, sort of do a finger dissection all the way down to the apex of the prostate posteriorly. Uh, and then we typically will incise the endopelvic fascia, throw some stitches in the dorsal venous complex, and then divide the pedicles. Um, you can use any form of energy if you want to divide the pedicles. You can use staplers, or you can even actually free tie things. Um, uh, for females, you do the same thing. So you want to go in the space of retius, then you want to incise the, uh, the round uh, ligament, and then you uh, we discussed at least a growing body of literature to support doing either uterine sparing or vaginal sparing cystectomies in females. So traditionally, if you look at a lot of the surgical atlases, the, the traditional cystectomy in a female is actually removing the anterior vaginal wall and then flapping the posterior vaginal wall sort of forward. And obviously you're shortening the vagina in that, in that area, which can cause a lot, a lot of dyspareunia uh, postoperatively and affect sexual function. <clears throat> so for tumors that are amenable, so not posterior tumors, but tumors of the dome, lateral, anterior, bladder wall tumors, I think that those are great cases for uh, vaginal sparing uh, cystectomy. And obviously, if you've got a tumor that looks like it's invading the vaginal wall, you don't want to do that. Uh, <clears throat> you also want to be mindful of the nerves that, um, that enter uh, and provide sexual function to females because there's a lot of, again, growing literature to suggest that uh, women have a lot of dyspareunia and problems with uh, vaginal lubrication and clitoral stimulation postoperatively, just like we see in the man uh, with a nerve sparing operation. Uh, we see uh, similar sexual side effects associated with a female cystectomy. Uh, then we typically will do a lymph node dissection coming down to the bottom of the slide here, and then a urinary diversion. Um, so considerations in a male, again, some people talk about doing prostate sparing cystectomies. I think that there's uh, advantages and disadvantages, and it's not typically common practice at our institution, uh, but there have been reports of improvement in urinary control and sexual function. Uh, one of the challenges that we tell people is that the, obviously you can get disease in the prostatic urethra, both prostate cancer can occur de novo, uh, which is difficult to manage in the post cystectomy setting as well as urothelial cell carcinoma, which may develop as a recurrence and also sort of difficult to manage um, if the prostate's still in situ. Uh, if you do a nerve sparing, so if you take the prostate out, you can also do a nerve sparing operation in a man, and there are reports as high as uh, 30 to 50% uh, improvement or uh, uh, maintenance of erectile function. Um, and then uh, again, debate about uh, how and when a urethrectomy is done. Typically, if you've got invasive disease at your urethral margin, 
Um, the uh, urethrectomy is recommended. About half of us at our institution do these at the time of surgery for a cystectomy, and then some of us will actually stage and do the urethrectomy to follow. I usually will stage because I think doing a cystoprostatectomy urinary diversion is a lot of operation. So I usually will try to bring people back three to six months later and do a staged urethrectomy, but I think both approaches are appropriate. Uh, I already mentioned the vaginal sparing operation and sexual function in the female. Uh, on the right side, you could just see sort of what the pelvic nervous plexus looks like in a female. So if you're doing vaginal sparing operations, you can see here on the bottom right that you sort of want to get underneath that bladder and sort of spare as much of the <clears throat> the the the, uh, the nerves as well as the pedicles to the to the vagina in order to preserve some of that sexual function as well. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about lymph node dissection. Uh, there's uh, again, uh, it seems like everything in urology is a debate, but there's a debate about how far we should do our lymph node dissections. The standard lymph node dissection. Uh, what's been described is uh, doing what's in the true pelvis, which is essentially your external and internal iliac um, uh, lymph nodes, as well as the obturator lymph nodes here. So you can see some of these lymph node tactics, five, nine, 10 here on the top here is your aorta with the IMA. That's what, where number three is. Um, and <clears throat> initially uh, sort of in the early 2000s, 2010s, there were some reports of improvement in survival uh, with an extended lymph node dissection and maybe that was uh, some staging uh, bias, but maybe some clinical improvement in doing a lymph node dissection as well. The extend, extended lymph node dissection typically covers your common iliacs, which are <clears throat> sort of in this four, uh, the deep obturators, the presacral space, which is uh, this A triangle here. And then for what people have described as a super extended uh, pelvic lymph node dissection, uh, is this one, two, and three, which is all the way up again to the IMA. <clears throat> there was a randomized control trial that was published a few years ago, looking at, uh, which is the Kaplan-Meier curves on the right-hand side, looking at recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific survival, and overall survival from an extended versus a limited LND. And this is about 400 patients, uh, which really showed no benefit in improvement in survival. Now there's obviously every study's got some challenges with it. So there were some challenges to the study. Uh, but again, I think that's still an unanswered question about how far up the lymphatic chain you go. The, <clears throat> there is a trial that we were actually a part of called the SWOG 1011 trial, uh, which was a randomized control trial. Again, trying to answer the same question about a limited lymph node dissection and an extended lymph node dissection. I think that trials are reporting out data this summer. So we should have uh, either data supporting this or data against this. Uh, which may help drive some clinical practices or recommendations. Uh, let me say, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Try to keep this sort of as casual as possible. Um, so <clears throat> uh, benchmarking some data uh, by stage. Uh, this is uh, one of the um, most prolific surgeons for urologic oncology was um, Dr. Stein. And he published some landmark studies just looking at cystectomies. If you have less than or equal to P2 disease, your occurrence-free survival is about 85%, but overall survival is about 78%. If you've got <clears throat> higher stage disease, greater than PT2, uh, your survival is, is not that great. It's pretty poor at about 50%. And if you've got nodal involvement, it drops pretty significantly here. So you can see some of these survival outcomes on the top right graph here. You can see organ confined. So this is your sort of less than or equal to T2 disease. Still good, but not great in terms of overall survival. But if you've got nodal disease or if you've got cancer that's outside the bladder, the survival is, is fairly poor <coughs> overall. The bottom right is uh, <clears throat> the Grossman data. This was the original study looking at uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, compared to cystectomy alone. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus cystectomy. And this is where we saw an overall sort of a 5% improvement in overall survival. And this became canon or sort of the standard of care for uh, patients that can tolerate or have access to or do not have contraindications to getting neuroadjuvant chemotherapy. So you can see on the top line here is, it's pretty small, but is your is your um, neuroadjuvant chemotherapy and on the bottom line is your cystectomy. So again, these, sur these survival curves sort of split pretty significantly. Uh, we also, there's some kind of studies looking at the hospital volume. So who's doing the operation and, uh, this is a complex operation to do, uh, for sure. Uh, and the more you do just like almost anything else, if you, if you look at the Malcolm Gladwell book about 
how you become an expert in something, you need to do something for 10,000 hours, whether it's playing the violin or computer programming or doing cystectomies, the more you do, the better the outcomes are. Um, so this was a study looking at hospital volume and surgeon volume and looking at patient outcomes. And you can see that uh, the, the low here had the higher mortality rates. So if you were a low surgeon, a moderate surgeon, a high surgeon, high surgeons had the and high volume centers had the, um, had the lowest mortality rates um, from the total number of cases done. So again, uh, pretty sub significant data uh, to suggest that uh, the high volume hospitals do better at treating this when you've got a complex operation. And we've done, and I'll show you some complication data, but we've done studies looking at um, sort of complication rates from uh, major morbidity operations. So esophagus removal, uh, thoracotomy, liver resection, and cystectomy still is up on that list as the highest, or as one of the highest complications on these uh, risk operation uh, for any kind of operation that you do to for oncology purposes. Um, it just is a fairly morbid operation. Bottom bottom graph shows the same thing, basically uh, favoring high volume uh, in terms of overall mortality. Uh, compared to low volume centers. And I shouldn't say it's just not just the surgeon uh, involved in this, but it's the whole hospital system. So if you've got nurses in the post-operative setting that are used to dealing with uh, cystectomy patients uh, and you have a whole sort of system set up that those patients do the best versus nurses that are may not be as familiar with these, not able to provide enough post-operative support for, mm -hmm. to some of these patients. Uh, I used to present the data from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering for complication rates, but this is sort of an updated version of that that was published last year, uh, not from MSK, but <clears throat> showing similar results in terms of complication rates from cystectomy. So again, here highlighting the morbidity of the operation in, in hospital complication rates are as high as 35% with a, almost a 40% 30-day complication rate. Most of these are low grade complications, which is your sort of your clavian grade ones and twos, but your clavian grade three, fours, and fives <coughs> is not insignificant. You can see I usually quote about a 10 to 15% risk of a high grade complication. So again, it goes to the fact that it's a, a fairly morbid operation. What I usually tell patients is that our anticipation is that their recovery sort of looks like an upward trajectory, but instead of looking like a straight line, it looks like a saw that sort of does one of these. So there are good days and bad days, and we expect some bad days along, along the way. Uh, but as long as the saw is pointed upwards, then <clears throat> we are encouraged. Uh, this is sort of a breakdown of what the complications look like. So uh, most of the complications that we see are either gastrointestinal complications or infectious complications, typically of the UTI or urinary tract infection uh, uh, tract. So again, the ileus is probably one of the most common complications that's seen for patients in the hospital. But you can see there's a whole host of things that can happen to patients. Uh, the, <coughs> uh, the GU complications, uh, ureter uh, leak or stenosis, uh, wound dehiscence, which can occur. Uh, <coughs> and you can get some... Um, uh, transfusion requirements as well. So again, major morbid operation, and it's good to have sort of a system set up to, to manage a lot of these. So I always sort of like to talk to people about how you manage some things, uh, which may be redundant, but <clears throat> if you have a bowel injury in the setting of a, a immediate operation, if it's just in the serosa, you can over -sew it. We typically recommend sort of a longitudinal uh, closure. So rather than if you have a sort of a transverse slice, you want to close it this this way. Uh, so that uh, you're not narrowing the bowel, but you're sort of making it a little bit of an accordion and that less you're less likely to get stenosis that way. If you've got a major uh, full thickness uh, uh, injury, you can either resect that piece of bowel yourself uh, or you do a two-layer uh, closure and you really, if the patient has momentum, you can throw some momentum on top in order to sort of seal it over. Uh, <clears throat> You can have vascular injuries, particularly in and around doing lymph node dissections. It's important to get uh, proximal intestinal control. Sometimes you can do that with a vascular clamp, or sometimes you just need to um, take a sponge stick and just put pressure, depending upon um, uh, how, how you can access some things. And obviously, you want to uh, put some forward prolines and close it as best you can. <clears throat> sometimes we'll either do palpation, or uh, I had one patient that had a crush injury of his internal iliac, sorry, external iliac artery. Uh, we were trying to control some bleeding and then we ended up having to sort of palpate it. We couldn't palpate it. We had to put a, a slight graft on top of it. 
uh, in order to get flow down to the vein, or sorry, down to the leg, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, you can sacrifice the internal vein and the internal artery. Uh, you do want to watch out for the obturator nerve. Uh, that typically gets in the way of you doing an, a, a nice um, lymph node dissection in the obturator region. So it's always important to identify that. We typically will identify that at the beginning of the operation uh, when we're sort of coming through the lateral pedicle so that we know, particularly patients with locally advanced disease, we can sort of push everything over. We say there's the nerve. So we know we're not going to injure it later. Um, <clears throat> the DVC can be a bloody area. And so typically if we're coming through the DVC uh, and we have a lot of blood and our DVC stitch didn't really work, then sometimes I'll do this little trick uh, here while I'll put the catheter through and then I'll pull it out above the pubic bone. And then what I'll do is I'll actually take a clamp and put a clamp right here uh, on, the, on, the, um, <clears throat> on the catheter, it's basically providing tension, upwards tension along the DVC. It's not a permanent fix, but if you're trying, if you're in a bloody situation and you just need to get the prostate and the bladder out in order to then see where you need to throw sutures, it sort of is a little helpful uh, trick to, to buy you a little bit of time in order to sort of move through the operation. So I call this a little catheter trick. I don't, I don't want to say I invented it myself, but it was it's something that we occasionally used. Other things during the surgery. So what if the ureter can't reach? Uh, so if the ureter can't reach, uh, and most of the time that's the left ureter, cause you're trying to transition that underneath the sigmoid mesentery. Uh, sometimes that's, uh, for radiation, uh, if patients have had cervical radiation or prostate or the ureter doesn't look healthy or there's tumor in the distal ureter. Also, uh, you can extend the conduit to below the sigmoid mesentery. So you just make a really long conduit and sort of tunnel underneath, or you could sort of bring up the ureter as a cutaneous ureter ostomy in a bailout situation. Um, when I first started uh, in my job, when I was a young ripper snapper, I was trying to do a neobladder and <clears throat> uh, I couldn't get that neobladder to reach down into the pelvis. Again, you can see here, if you've got all the bowel up here, trying to get this small bowel all the way down to the urethra sometimes can be a little bit tricky. Uh, so one of my senior partners came in and said, well, is the bed flexed? And I typically, when I do this operation, I do have some flex to the bed and we unflex the bed and immediately the neobladder came down. So the first thing I would do is Take, uh, take stock in what you're doing, then unflex the table. Then you can do this thing called laddering of the mesentery of the bowel. So that's what this looks like here. If you're trying to get something to reach, you actually incise the mesentery here, not fall through because you don't want to make internal hernias or compromise the blood supply to the bowel. Uh, but if you do this laddering technique here, you can actually gain a significant amount of length in order to get the bowel down into the, um, into the pelvis to reach. Uh, and I've done that in a number of cases to, for, to that have helped. So in the post-operative setting, there's some complications that lead to readmission. Typically, those are this idea of dehydration. Uh, we call this sort of like a failure to thrive picture where patients are just sort of like lying at home, not doing anything. They're not moving. And typically, for whatever reason, um, a lot of times patients lose their appetite after surgery. I like to blame anesthesia, but it's probably a combination of things. And <clears throat> um, they, so they don't eat, they don't drink, they get dehydrated and they end up coming in and then sometimes they'll end up getting a pyelonephritis. So there's a number of reasons why people get <clears throat> readmitted. Typically within the first 30 days, it's sort of a hodgepodge within that 30 to 90 day period. It's, it's usually an infectious complication, uh, usually associated with the urinary diversion if they're getting readmitted to the hospital. Uh, <clears throat> we have sort of, um, gone to a model in the US where there's uh, more higher volume surgeons, but there are fewer of them. So there's uh, a couple of urologists that do two to three cystectomies uh, uh, per year, but fewer that are doing uh, uh, many, many cystectomies. But as you can see, the volumes for, or the, the outcomes for the higher volume surgeons are, are better. And so <clears throat> it's uh, sort of important to, to keep that in mind. Um, so talking about urinary diversions, um, there's about 10,000 cases performed uh, in the U.S. A lot of them are ileal conduits, but it sort of depends on the surgeon, the patient population. In Florida, we've got an older patient population, so our numbers, I think, are skewed more towards ileal conduits, not that we don't offer neobladders. Um, but if you go sort of to places in the West Coast, I think the incidence of neobladders is higher. Maybe that's a patient uh, population issue. Um, some people say that almost 85% of uh, patients are candidates for continent urinary diversions. Uh, and really the object of the urinary diversion is to replace bladder function, which really implies low pressure storage and, uh, and intermittent and complete emptying of urine. 
Um, so you can do uh, different types of urinary diversions using different segments of bowel. We typically don't use uh, the stomach anymore. Uh, people getting hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome where they were essentially bleeding uh, into their urinary diversion using stomach. We don't use jejunum anymore because that can cause a significant uh, metabolic abnormalities. We do use the right colon typically for colon pouches or for transverse colon conduits. Uh, less commonly, we see, that was seen a lot in the GYM um, groups, and I think they still do that for patients that have had cervical cancer. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, and the rectum and sigmoid are sort of infrequently used, and people don't really do ureter or SIGs anymore. So, the terminal ileum is typically what's most commonly used either for your uh, ileal neobladder, either doing Hauptmann's or doing Studer pouches or doing uh, Indiana pouch, Florida pouch, Miami pouch, whatever kind of pouch you want using the right colon. Um, so <clears throat> this is typically what we present to our patients here. The three standard types of urinary diversions is either ileal conduit here, small segment is uh, uh, the TI terminal ileum is taken uh, <clears throat> and then brought out to the abdominal wall as a stoma. You can use a colon pouch where you're basically, again, taking the colon, um, detubularizing it, and then building a channel out to the abdominal wall, which then gets catheterized. Um, if you look at the complication rates from this, uh, the stoma complications are about 15 to 20% due to stomal stenosis. Uh, patients also uh, get um, pouchitis and stones. I usually liken this to sort of siphoning it off fish tanks. If you have a fish tank at home and you want to change the water, you got a poo tube in, then you got to sort of suck on the tube and the water comes out, but it's really hard to get all of the water at the bottom of the fish tank out. And so you're always sort of left with this re residue, um, has been my experience. Um, so I'd rather have gravity help my situation by giving somebody a neobladder and not having them to have to catheterize if they're on a train plane, if they're home and they lose catheters, then their colon pouch is not going to work very well. They're going to run into an emergency. But if you have a neobladder that's hooked up to urethra, gra gravity will help you usually eliminate the urine. Uh, I always ask our um, uh, fellows and residents when we're doing training how much small bowel you can actually live with. And that number is actually, <clears throat> so if you do an operation or God forbid somebody ends up in the trauma uh, bay and you have to resect their small bowel, how much small bowel can you actually live with? And that number is usually around 20 centimeters, uh, but it really depends on what your what your patient, the patient's weight is. The larger the, the patient, the more... <clears throat> um, the more small bowel that they need to live. And really the sort of the important cutoff, I think is, you know, this 40 to 80 range, and you're usually good if you've got 80 centimeters of small bowel. So if you're considering doing a neobladder on somebody, you want to make sure that if they've had previous bowel resections, that they have an adequate amount of residual bowel that's left for their normal bowel function. Uh, and so what I will do is I'll actually measure and then document the residual bowel. We'll run it all the way to the ligament of trites, uh, to make sure and measure that out. So we can say, okay, this patient's definitely not going to have malabsorption problem. So again, we talked about the use of bowel segment, segments. You can use stomach, jejunum, ileum, colon. Uh, <clears throat> the stomach, again, is less perme permeable. Uh, and then you get this hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. The stomach is the only one that gives you this metabolic alkalosis because you're losing the acid from the stomach into your urinary segments. Jejunum, as said, we typically don't use because you get these severe electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, so again, ileum and colon are the most commonly used. Uh, we're, it's usually the most, we're, we're, as urologists, we're the most familiar using these things too. We sort of know what the, the standard blood supply is. Um, so it's pretty good. So I usually say this is the, how to make a neobladder 101. Um, there's different, there's two different ways uh, or common ways to do neobladder. One is the Studer. Uh, the other is the Hauptmann. I'm a big fan of the, the Hauptmann neobladder, but again, you want to take uh, 15 centimeters from the ileocecal junction. You take about, I usually use about a 65 centimeter segment of my small bowel to do this. And then <clears throat> I make it into a W, which is the Hauptmann. I sort of like it. I think it makes a nice reservoir. Uh, and then you basically sew it in, in on three sides and then flip it over. And so um, the, uh, the bowel into it. I like it also because you can get two chimneys separately coming up like this. And so you got ureter into one. If you need to make a longer ureter, because <laughs> one of your ureters doesn't look healthy, then you can make a longer chimney out of it. And I think it adds a lot of a lot of sort of opportunity to do those things. You can also make a studer, which is the one on the left where you sort of get one fold and then a flip of the fold. Uh, you have a common channel. This studer is actually really nice if you 
think that downstream patients aren't going to do well with a neobladder and they're going to need to be transitioned to a conduit, you can easily sort of flip that segment up to bring in the abdominal wall. It's really hard to convert a Houtman to, um, to having a conduit. And then colon pouches, again, here, depending upon how much colon you use, uh, then you sort of open up, detubularize, plug the ureters in, and then create a channel out of the terminal ileum. Some people do cecal wraps in order to gain confidence. Some people sort of do this nipple valve technique, which is usually what I do for uh, my, my continent diversions. So there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the um, the continence rates and, and common specific complication rates uh, for the cutaneous pouches. Uh, you can see there's a risk of stone disease associated with Indiana pouches, uh, and you get some con you get stonal stenosis. Uh, the continence rates are all usually really good if it's done well. There's a lot of testing that we do if we're doing a continent, a continent cutaneous diversion, you know, Indiana pouch, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> but um, as I said, I'm not a huge fan of these because of the siphoning off issue and the risk of uh, stomal stenosis, um, as well as calculus issues. So I'd rather do something else if I can. We will do them otherwise. Continence rates for neobladders. <clears throat> uh, so I usually tell people that the continence rates are pretty good, especially during the daytime here. You can see that that's in yellow. This is months from surgery on the bottom. So usually I quote about a 90, 80 to 90% continence rates after a neobladder. The problem is what I tell patients is that once you fall asleep, your pelvis falls asleep too, and you've got a higher risk of leaking at nighttime. So we usually tell people there's a 30 to 50% risk of nighttime incontinence. Uh, and then most, most patients that we operate on will either wear, if they're bothered by incontinence, will either wear uh, sort of a, a pads in their sleeping trousers, or they'll uh, wear a condom cath if they're men um, overnight, if they have significant leakage. Um, just going to move this out of the way. So there are some contraindications to doing continent uh, diversions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the If you've got poor kidney function or chronic renal insufficiency uh, uh, with a cranium that's above two, typically that will sort of affect your um, metabolic uh, syndrome and it puts you in sort of a hypercalcemic state. And with a little bit of uremia, it's not good in terms of your overall um, <clears throat> electrolyte imbalance. So typically, uh, if you've got a high creatinine, um, uh, we don't we don't do uh, continent diversions. The one of the clinical challenges is a lot of patients come in obstructed with their tumors, and if you bring them straight to cystectomy, you don't know whether <clears throat> the, if you unobstruct their kidneys, what their kidney function is going to do. So I usually try to give patients the benefit of the doubt. If on an ultrasound or a CT scan, it looks like they've got adequate parenchyma and they're obstructed, then a lot of times we'll, if we're going straight to surgery, then we'll try to give them a continent diversion with the understanding that their kidney function will likely improve. Obviously, if you've got bowel problems, short gut syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease with Crohn's, if you've had a radiated abdomen, or if you've got a history of colon cancer or colon polyps, you don't want to use the right colon. <clears throat> uh, and if you've got a history of uh, severe incontinence, or we used to ask people to, you know, to be willing to catheterize after getting a neobladder. Um, some men are okay with that because they don't want to have an external stoma. And that's more important than having a catheter <clears throat> or catheterizing them themselves. But in a small so select amount of patients, the neobladder is going to not drain well and they need to catheterize. And so you need to have a patient that's willing to do that. Some men will look at you completely sideways and ask, you know, when you tell them you, you're going to need to do a self-cath. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that everything is sort of a trade-off. So uh, again, uh, metabolic complications can be divided into several subcategories, including electrolytes, abnormal drug metabolism, growth retardation, urethysis, gastrointestinal malabsorption. So the most common metabolic abnormalities are <clears throat> typically if you're using the um, terminal ileum and colon or the hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, this results from excess ammonium chloride absorption across the lumen of the intestinal segment. Usually you can uh, effectively manage this with the alkalinization with oral sodium bicarb. If you give too much sodium bicarb though, uh, uh, that can affect their, if they've got a history of CHF can sort of put them in volume overload. So <clears throat> sometimes we'll alter that by giving them potassium citrate um, then there's uh, some other issues regarding, <coughs> sorry, uh, urethral stricture rates, uh, chronic renal insufficiency, urolithiasis, et cetera. Uh, and then about 13 to 15% of people have some, um, uh, infectious complications. So again, here we talk about this hyperchloremic, hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. If you're doing your recertification exams, this is, I think, something that ends up being very testable, or if you're doing, 
uh, if you're a resident and you're or a trainee and you're taking some standardized exams, typically your hyperchloremic, hypokalemic, bad bulk acidosis is what you see with your urinary diversion. Uh, the jejunum <clears throat> really loses sodium more than anything else and can cause this severe hyponatremia, which is why we usually try to avoid it at all costs. And again, as I said, the stomach is the only thing that's going to give you that metabolic alkalosis. So again, as I said, oral sodium bicarb uh, is effective, but sometimes that large sodium can cause some fluid overload. Uh, so we try to use uh, either sodium citrate or you can also use potassium citrate. You can also use nicotinic acid or clopromazine. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> you can also use calcium supplements because you can cause, if you've got this chronic metabolic acidosis that can read, uh, result in decalcification of the bone and osteopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, so again, looking at the different diversions and some of the other complication rates, you can see here uh, some stoma complications. Obviously, your continent diversions are going to have lower stoma complications, especially if you look at neobladders. Um, infection rates <clears throat> are usually pretty close. Uh, some people ask about, is UTI more common with neobladder, with conduits? And I think it's about the same. Uh, the obstruction rates are the same. Uh, so really, the infection rates, I think, are relatively similar between the use of bowel, and it really sort of depends on the other factors associated with some of these things in terms of complication rates. Uh, some people form stones, um, uh, and that's typically uh, because of <clears throat> um, decreased urinary citrate levels uh, and oxalate reabsorption. And you can get pouch uh, calculi that develop in about 10% of the, the uh, continent diversions, as I talked about. Uh, you can also get GI malabsorption. Uh, diarrhea can be common and problematic after diversions, and that can really affect quality of life. Uh, you can use cholestyramine uh, that binds bile salts to reduce diarrhea. Uh, and you can also use uh, <clears throat> uh, lopiramide, uh, the, one of the motility inhibitors uh, in refractory cases. So you can sort of slow people down with Lamotil uh, if they've got really bad GI. Typically, we see this a lot in your the patients where you take the ileal cecal junction. So they basically, if you're doing a uh, again a pouch, you're going straight from small bowel to usually transverse colon, and that without that ileal cecal junction to sort of help slow down uh, and allow time for the bowel to sort of get dehydrated in the colon or the bowel contents, I should say, then you end up with a lot of these sort of diarrhea complications. Uh, <clears throat> So the, there's also a risk of long-term renal dysfunction associated with radical cystectomy. Uh, this was a study out of the Mayo Clinic uh, up in Rochester, looking at the risk of uh, drop in your GFR, new onset chronic kidney disease. Uh, and as, uh, as you follow patients along, there's a fairly significant drop-off, regardless or regardless of their urinary diversion type. Uh, between um, incontinent and continent diversions. Some of that has to do with either refluxing um, anastomosis, so patients will get hydro, or has to do with uh, repeated events of pyelonephritis. Uh, some of this may be also be due to, to routine aging as we get older. Uh, we lose about 1% of our kidney function per year starting at age 40. So if you look at people at age 60 plus, uh, they've already lost you know upwards of about 20% of their overall kidney function. But uh, regardless of urinary diversion, uh, you can see this decline in, uh, <clears throat> in kidney function. Um, I'll stop there and see if we've got any questions. I went through the, a lot of this stuff very quickly, I think. Um, Dr. Podge, <clears throat> Dr. Adai has some questions in the chat. Oh, let me see if I can pull that up. I didn't see that. And I can't access chat. Why not? Um, I can read them if you want me to. Uh, sure. Okay. I, for some reason, I can't get, come up. There's a couple. Um, Dr. Ed, I asked, how do you prepare the bowel before surgery? Uh, so this is a good question. We typically um, have the patient drink some clear... If, so it depends on the type of diversion. If they're doing a conduit, we typically uh, have them drink basically liquids the day before, try to do clear liquids if possible. Um if they're having a colon pouch, then we typically want them to do a full bowel prep so that there's no fecal matter in the colon. Uh, and usually that's either with mag citrate or go lightly. Um, <clears throat> or some people have actually used just double dosing Miralax um, and sort of taking uh, some electrolyte drink, whether it's Gatorade or whatever it is with Miralax, and you sort of take uh, two double doses of that. Uh, 
Uh, we try to, we try to actually have our patients drink up to about four hours prior to their operation. Cause there's this whole concept of sort of, um, having, um, patients get being dehydrated going into operation. So if you can actually keep maintain their hydration status up to about four hours prior to operation, they actually do better in terms of their volume status require less IV fluids during the operation and less volume shifting. Um, and so we've actually seen sort of an improvement when we do this idea of enhanced recovery after surgery. So we basically prep the patient and then do a couple of maneuvers in the operating room and then sort of early mobilize patients with, uh, not giving them nasogastric tubes and getting them up and walking and actually feeding them more, uh, earlier than we traditionally use. So most of our patients will be getting liquid diets on post-op day one, and we try to feed people solid food by post-op day three. <clears throat> Um, the next question is how long do patients spend in the hospital? On average for us, it's about six days. So, and um, either it's, uh, us you know, whether we're doing them, the operations with the robot or whether we're doing it open, it's usually six days on average. Are you doing the ERAS protocol? We do. Yeah. We've got a number of sort of things that we do for our ERAS. As I mentioned, a lot of times we're our sort of um, letting people sort of be a little bit more liberal about their NPO status. Uh, that's number one. We try to do this thing called immunonutrition where, where the patients are actually drinking arginine supplemented drinks prior to surgery for three days. Uh, and they're also doing this thing called clear fast where they're getting sort of um, uh, loads of simple carbohydrates beforehand so that they're not in a catabolic state. Um, as I said, postoperatively, we're not putting in nasogastric tubes and we're early feeding them and we're early ambulating them, which helps. And we try to minimize narcotics when we can. So if we can get our anesthesi anesthesiologist to put in epidurals, um, that actually minimizes their oral, the, either the oral uh, narcotics they have to take or the IV narcotics they have to take for pain control. And we started recently doing tap blocks on some of these patients also which for pain control, which minimizes their narcotic use. We also use alvimapan, which is enteroag, which is blocks the opioid receptors, uh, which has been shown to improve the, the time to bowel recovery as well. And then the last one, how do you manage a patient with SCC of the bladder with bowel invasion? Uh, <clears throat> so if you've got somebody with uh, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, primary squamous cell carcinoma, we typically don't give them chemo at all. I think it's sort of a surgical disease and depends on what part of the bowel is involved. If they've got small bowel involvement, if small bowel is sort of sitting on top of the bladder, usually then we'll just proceed with cystectomy and do a bowel resection at the same time. If they've got posterior bladder tumor that looks like it's involving the rectum, then it's a little bit more challenging because a lot of times if you can achieve a surgical resection, then you're looking at a uh, pelvic exoneration. Uh, <clears throat> which we typically will do with uh, our colon, you know, with the help of our colorectal surgeons. Um, sometimes if we think we've got patients with like T4 disease, uh, we've talked about giving them chemotherapy uh, preoperatively, but for squamous cell carcinoma, there's not a ton of chemotherapy that works in the sort of the new adjuvant setting to downstage. So a lot of times it's just surgical. And that's all the questions in the chat. Dr. Indai, do you have anything else? Great. <laughs> Yeah, let me try if you can hear me. Yes. My my next okay. So thank you for the presentation. Basically, uh from what you're saying, um we kind of do much similar things like you do. Uh Dr. Amwa, who is still on the online with me. We sometimes do like four or five radical cystectomies in a month. Um, in, the, in the course of this year alone, we've done about 10 to 15 of radical cystectomies. Basically, we our patients don't accept easily the incontinent diversion, so we are forced to do the new bladder for them. A few cases where we could not do a new bladder because the ureth we felt the urethra uh, may be involved. We have done a pouch with um, a Monty procedure to bring uh, an outlet to the around the umbilicus. Um, our main challenge that we we tend to experience with this kind of diversion 
is the fact that some of these patients with squamous cell carcinoma, they tend to recur easily and uh, compromise the renal function. I remember a patient we did with infiltration into the anterior abdominal wall because somebody had placed a suprapubic catheter and the tumor had invaded <laughs> the whole anterior abdominal wall. But it was squamous cell carcinoma. And so we had to get it out. But we, from hindsight, we were supposed to have done an earlier conduit, but we did a minus two pouch. And after six months, there was tumor recurrence because the patient will not go for chemo because of poverty and all. And so this, these are the, demogra- the things that we experienced here as you come next month for the workshop. You may, you, you may be faced with this uh, T4, not to the bone, T4A, <laughs> uh, a lot of lymph nodes. Uh, you, you, you have to expect some things like this because that's what we do when you come. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think it's interesting when I was a fellow uh, training um, up in Buffalo, it seemed as though um, we had gotten a decent amount of standard, I would call standard muscle invasive bladder cancers. Um, Moving down to Florida, I don't know whether it's a patient population or we're sort of in the smoking belt or whatever it is, but it seemed like the pathology and the stage of disease when patients were presenting here is actually much higher. So we sort of have an experience, uh, hmm. more advanced uh, sort of oncology cases, or maybe it's just the, re- the nature of the referral center here comparatively, but um, <clears throat> uh, certainly uh, look forward to coming and sort of trying to help as best we can manage some of these things together. Great, great. We're grateful. We, we really, our average time for these surgeries is about eight hours, and uh, we're looking forward to see how you can help us bring the time down to like six hours. But we almost always do some form of a new bladder. Are you mostly doing Hauptmann neo bladders or Studer neo bladders? Uh, the Hauptmann, is it the is it this man from Germany, not uh, Studer? The one we 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 fold into a W. Yeah, the Hartman. Yeah, Hartman pouch. Yeah, that's, that's what usually, we do. Most. That's usually my preferred as well. So wonderful, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> and so, how is your application coming up with the visa acquisition and the temporal registration? Uh, I think we've submitted everything, and I think our passports went to the um, to the embassy today, actually, for an expedited review or whatever expedited visa. Wonderful. So hopefully, Wonderful. no snags, and we get it back within the next two weeks or so. So great, great. So, looking forward to it, Doctor and I. Um, yes, yeah, actually, I'm done. Thank you so much um, for your time today. And Dr. Dai, thanks for helping coordinate. And I was looking up, I was looking this up because I've been following the World Cup and I know that Ghana's playing tomorrow. Uh, yes, yes. But I didn't realize yes. there was this huge controversy between Ghana and Uruguay regarding like a uh, old handball that occurred like in 2010. That there was like a, there was a big controversy. It's still, it's still within... It's still within the hearts of many people in Ghana, and it's like the guy robbed the whole of Africa from going to the semi-final. So the, yeah. the guy is hated to he hated so much yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope you guys agree. Well, I hope you can arrange. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I, you likely win. You yeah, I hope you guys win, and I hope you know they suffer. <laughs> uh, they suffer the defeat. So. We'll be watching Dr. Adai, but you have to cheer us. That's out right. Thank you day. very much. <laughs> All right. Take care. And we I think will do I'll... so. We will yeah. definitely be supporting you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.